in a second chapter, Ralph focuses on the relationship between knowing how and knowing that. As I mentioned before, Ralph is one of the philosophers in the 20th century who emphasizes not just the importance of propositional knowledge, but knowing how, what sometimes is referred to as ability knowledge. And, and remember that while knowing that is a matter of having justified true belief that a certain proposition is the case, knowing how is more like a skill, competence, in some cases even expertise. Knowing how to do something such as, for example, spot a certain species of bird or converse empathetically or tie a certain kind of knot. And again, you can know how to do something even if you're fast asleep or for some re other reason not doing it, but rather you're disposed to do that under the, under the right conditions. Raoul will now say, after distinguishing between knowing how and knowing that, that it's tempting, especially for those that he considers to be part of the platonic and Cartesian tradition that's also taken up by many other philosophers in the Western, Western tradition, that it's tempting to say, well, all knowing how must be the result of some kind of propositional knowledge. And Ryle talks about what he refers to as the intellectualist doctrine. That intellectualist doctrine is precisely the view that all intelligence is a matter of ap apprehending truths, and therefore behaving intelligently is a matter of applying that apprehension of truths to action, to agency. You might think about cases in which, suppose you're just learning how to drive, and there are facts about how one should drive when in a certain kind, kind of situation, the right thing to do is so-and-so. And it might be that you have those before your mind when you're learning what to do under certain circumstances, or perhaps when you're learning to play chess, you've got certain rules such as when this is moved in a certain way, you have to move two forward and one to the right or one to the left. When this other piece is moved, it can only move one space forward at a time, etc. Those are truths, we might say, that govern the playing of chess. But Raoul wants to suggest that these are ways in which you could learn these skills. You can state them as facts or, or truths if you want to, and then applying them in practice, but those are not mandatory. And the reason is that he asks us to imagine a child who just watches lots of chess games, watches people playing chess for many years, and gradually absorbs the game without ever paying attention to the question whether there are any particular rules. He, and he learns the rules, but is never aware of himself as doing so, and certainly couldn't tell you what the rules are in the course of playing the game, and he could become a very good chess player in the process. Or to take a more contemporary example, one that became very influential after the writing of Rao's book, the example of learning language. According to contemporary linguists, at least the majority of linguists, when you learn a language, you internalize a huge number of rules as to how grammatical sentences can be constructed to say nothing of what words mean. And generally speaking, when you internalize those rules, you're not aware of yourself as doing so. And in fact, when you take a linguistics class, you might be surprised to learn that there are lots of rules that govern how you change one, how you transform one sentence, one sentence into another for, for purposes of efficient communication. You're aware of the fact those transformations are perfectly meaning preserving. They are synonyms of the original thing that was transformed, but you're not aware, at least at the conscious level, of what it was that you were doing in the process. You in internalize these grammatical rules, that is, but never at least explicitly or consciously formulate them in terms of propositions that then are applied to practice. Now, you can imagine an objection to Ralph's position here that says, well, maybe these are unconscious, they're internalized, but you're not, we're, not a, we're not conscious of the fact that we're doing so. We'll get to that line of thought about unconscious, unconscious mental states in a couple of lectures ahead of us. But for now, Raoul thinks that I suspect that Raoul would say, even if we could respond to these examples by positing unconscious rules, He'll want to say, nevertheless, it couldn't be that all intelligent behavior is due to the application of rules to particular cases, to particular practical cases. And here's why. What he refers to, he refers to this as the crucial objection to the intellectualist legend. The crucial objection goes as follows. If you are an intellectualist, you're going to say whenever somebody behaves intelligently, they are applying a rule to the particular case at hand, driving, playing chess, interpreting sentences behaving politely, thousands of other cases are possibilities. But Raoul will say, the application of a general precept or rule or a bit of propositional knowledge that you take yourself to have to the particular case in hand is something that you can do either better or worse, well or poorly, or somewhere in between. But that means that applying the 
general precept to the action in question is itself something that is intelligently done or not. But when it's intelligently done, that must be because there's a rule that says when you've got rule type X, apply it in a certain way to action situation type Y. So that you've got to have, a, a, as it were, a meta rule that tells you how to apply the non-meta, the lower level rule, to the particular action question that's confronting you. But wait, the application of that meta rule to tell you how to apply this rule to this particular action situation is something that can be done better or worse. So Ralph suggests there must be another rule, a meta-meta rule that you have to invoke in order to apply the meta rule to the first level rule to the action. And that's a regress that will never, that, that will never stop, according to Ralph. So the crucial objection that Ralph offers to the intellectualist legend is one that says, in order to apply even the simplest rule, you'd have to apply uncountably many rules in the process. And that seems incredibly implausible as an account of what happens when a person moves their chess piece effectively and within the rules, or speaks grammatically, or listens empathetically, or distinguishes one bird from another. That all seems like it puts much too much pressure on intellectual operations to explain relatively straightforward competencies, skills, and in some cases, even expertise. So that is that even if there is some, and Rawls, I think, happy to accept that there's plenty of propositional knowledge, that can't be all the knowledge that there is. There must also be some know-how that, that is not itself backed up by propositional knowledge. Again, to take more examples of what Ralph considers to be intelligence that's right there in front of you that does not require supposing that the person in question is applying rules to the case at hand, he asks you to think about a clown, for example, at a birthday party, clowning cleverly in such ways to make the children giggle. That clever clowning is something that's right there in the behavior itself. You don't need to suppose that the clown is applying rules to the particular case. The clown is just doing what comes naturally to him or her. Likewise, there are plenty of cases in which we say things to ourself we might have to, especially if we're novices in a certain in a certain area that requires skill, we might have to repeat to ourselves various precepts as, as to how to act. But once we've internalized what to do, there no longer has to be the application of general rules to particular cases of action. After a while, we have what Rao will refer to as second nature, second nature competencies that are fairly automatic, that don't require a great deal of cognitive labor, but that still allow us to behave in quite competent ways. So getting back to his notion of multi-track dispositions, if we think of minds as large conjuries of multi-track dispositions, we're going to say many of those dispositions are relatively high level and might be the result of a fair bit of rigorous, painstaking, long-term training. Some authors have said, for example, that to be an expert in something, you have to have spent about 10,000 hours acquiring that expertise. That might be true. But once you've got that expertise, there's no reason to think that you have to have before your mind general precepts or rules or propositions that guide your behavior. So even for very high level types of skill, sometimes somebody can just follow, if they have the appropriate skills, just follow their gut and still and make judgments that require a great deal of sophistication. That doesn't mean that if I don't have that skill, that my gut feeling is going to be worth very much. But for the gut feeling of an expert art historian or forensic scientist, or jurist, or physician, that those gut feelings can often be very powerful indicators of how to proceed in deciding about difficult situations, in some cases on which people's lives might depend. We can think of Descartes' position as almost yielding to a reductio, to a reductio ad absurdum. And that reductio ad absurdum is the idea of solipsism. Solipsism being the view that I know that I have a mind, I know that I exist and have mental states, but the idea that anybody else has them is going to be at best a conjecture that I can never know for sure to be true. But Raoul says, look, if you've got yourself into a position that has that as a consequence, there's probably something wrong with the position that forced you there. Instead, he writes, I discover that there are other minds in understanding what people say and do, in making sense of what you say, in appreciating your jokes, in following your arguments, in hearing you pick holes in my argument. I'm not inferring to the workings of your mind. I am following them. So the idea that I can follow the workings of your mind right there on as the teacher watches the school child go through some mathematical calculations, as the violin 
teacher watches the student practice her scales on the violin, for example. Those are all going to be cases in which the expert can see the intelligent behavior right there in the action, doesn't have to infer anything about the mind that brought it about. This is an important insight on Rao's part, it seems to me. Nowadays, in, ex in contemporary experimental psychology, there's a lot of interest in what's known as embodied cognition. And I want to suggest that Rao's way of put, expressing himself here is a bit of a sort of prescient gl uh, glimpse of a view that's becoming widely discussed and substantiated by a, a fair bit of empirical investigation, the idea of embodied cognition. If Rao's right, yes, there's a, lot, there's a lot of cognition that's right there in the behavior, and we don't need to suppose that it's the result of anything internal. It could be, but the important thing is that it doesn't have to be. There can be, can be intelligence and intelligent behavior right there before our eyes. Thank you.